I'm here tonight to introduce a Bronze Age site in the far east of London at Wennington in the borough of Havering. The site is characterised by the presence of a classic founder's hoard, but unusually one found within the context of an enclosure rather than in isolation by field walking or metal detecting. I hope this creates a new frame through which this conspicuous deposition can be viewed. When thinking about how to present the site, I kept being drawn back to the visual aesthetic, the shiny reflective surfaces of the original bronze items and how bright they must have looked in an otherwise very naturalistic landscape of marshy greens and browns. This was rather emphasised by the glaring sunrises and sunsets over the former marshes, extending to the west of the site, and captured here in a couple of very artistic photographs. In seeking visual analogies for this, I kept hitting upon a late 19th century painting entitled Sunset Over the Marsh by Martin Johnson Head, which characterises the artistic movement of luminism which focused on the effects of light on the landscape. I promise this isn't a massive deviation from prehistory, but I hope to demonstrate that it is the setting of this site and its relationship to river and marsh, as well as specific depositional context that will allow us to add fresh evidence to how we consider founders' hordes. So overtly, I may talk a lot about metalwork, which is not my natural environment, but I think the site provides both a natural and historic stage, both literally and figuratively given its very square prominent shape, upon which the Horde is the sole surviving character that we can interrogate. I'm not going to be coy about the presence of a Horde, but I will say more about its reveal as we go on. However, first a little about the nature of the project. You may have seen adverts for what has become known as the Havering Horde at the Museum of London Docklands, or even been to visit already. It's open until April. This represents an exclamation mark in what is an ongoing commercial project, with the pace of at least partial analysis being rapidly accelerated by potential public engagement. The site was and is part of a quarry operated by Ingraborn Valley, that will supply London with sand and gravel for some time to come. And although this phase of excavation by Archaeological Solutions was towards the end of 2019, we have just concluded an adjacent area of equal size and will be returning again in the near future. Normally, the analysis and write-up of such a project may extend over the following years. But after a visit from Roy Stevenson, acting as a champion of Museum of London exhibitions, and in coordination with Adam Single of the Greater London Archaeological Advisory Service, as well as members of the Portable Antiquities Scheme and Historic England, the post-excavation process was reshaped and targeted to be driven by the design and opening of this exhibition, rather than the typical progress towards an archaeological publication, which will come. I'm sure most of you don't need an introduction to the geography of the Lower Thames, but a quick look down on where we are and some of the principal Late Bronze Age sites close by, courtesy of Google. Our site sits just one kilometre to the north of the current channel of the River Thames, just highlighting here in red. It's a short distance to the south of Late Bronze Age settlements at South Hornchurch, Hunts Hill Farm and Hackton. The former included a sword mould from on-site metalworking and the latter a further bronze socketed axe. Even more pertinently, less than a kilometre to the east on Sandy Lane, Averley, a hoard of bronze was recovered in 1968 but remains unpublished. Slightly further east, we have large ringwork settlements at Mucking and Chadwell St Mary. Mucking, one of the most well-known Late Bronze Age sites, produced a vast finds assemblage, including moulds and implements that include the presence of a bronze refractory. Most recently published in 2016 in the monumental Lives in Land monograph. The ring work at Chadwell St Mary, published this year in BAR 654, produced an extensive post-Deverell Rimbury pottery assemblage, 
the principal type of late Bronze Age pottery, and characteristic perforated clay plates, but curiously, no metalwork. These London gravels must now be one of the most well explored prehistoric landscape zones in the country, mainly due to mineral extraction. So, it is abundantly clear and well established that we are in the middle of a fairly densely populated for the period landscape. It's aligned along the resources provided by the Lower Thames, most notably the access provided by the rivers and estuaries that extend to the coastlines of Essex and Kent. This is most aptly demonstrated by this map, lifted from Timothy Champion's paper on the characteristic perforated clay plates found on so many sites in the region, including this one. They appear a common domestic component, possibly associated with ovens and baking, food drying or curing, and possibly even salt production, but almost certainly not metalworking. I've also marked on Broomfield Chelmsford to the north, part of this settlement distribution, because it has an enclosure that I'll come to for comparison shortly. The gravel terraces that attract mineral extraction today were equally favourable for late Bronze Age settlement. This geological plan illustrates how the site at Wellington is situated on the projection of those gravels overlooking former alluvium that is derived from the now drained marshes that once bordered the river. The Colne Watercourse and Mardike are situated to the northwest and southeast, and narrow spurs of alluvium either side of the site suggest it was hemmed in by further inlets. Here and here. The result is that the site was likely enclosed on three sides by natural barriers with a terrestrial facade and access from the northeast. Very swiftly, to demonstrate the impact of the former marsh and how much of a shoreline, natural resource and barrier it may have provided, I'm going to show this 1770 map. It's clear habitation off the gravel terraces was not an option, or at least not a pleasant one, even then. And that the river at this point effectively becomes an even wider corridor based around the borders of the marshes, coming through here. Almost moving on to the here and now, prior to beginning trial trench and then open area excavations, it was clear through aerial photo evidence that we had a square enclosure within the site. Nonetheless, if you had asked for a prediction, I'd have probably said Iron Age to Roman rather than Late Bronze Age, consistent with many farmsteads also excavated on the gravels, but to what we did find when we stripped the site. Stripping off a wide area revealed a square enclosure corresponding to our crop mark in the southwest corner. Here. Adjacent to the west was a messy arrangement of post medieval quarry pits exploiting the gravel. Further to the west were a series of field boundaries ranging from Roman to post medieval. Most pertinently, the gravels were covered by a layer of alluvium in the western half of the site, which combined with the apparent absence of prehistoric features sealed by it, suggests that the marshlands may once have extended very close to the rear of our late Bronze Age enclosure. Zooming in on the enclosure, we can see how it appears when it was cleaned prior to excavation and once it had been fully excavated. The initial methodology was to excavate a 50% sample of the ditch in segments. But as the hoard was discovered fairly early on in this process, it was decided that the entire enclosure would be 100% excavated and sieved. You can see we have a full circuit of the ditch with a single entrance to the east, slightly expanded ditch terminals either side of that entrance, and a cluster of post holes within the center of the enclosure here. There is also a set of four posts in the center here and a further set of four posts just outside the rear of the enclosure here. 
Both sets of the four posts are significantly more robust than the post holes that form the roundhouse. Elsewhere, post holes and pits are very sparse. Um, a few tree throws may also be contemporary with Bronze Age activity inside the enclosure. Without jumping too far ahead of myself, I've marked the location of the hoard in yellow. But first, we can look at the broad structure of this enclosure. We certainly have a single central roundhouse. And on this plan, we've postulated that the central four post structure may have acted as an entrance way to it here. But equally, as alternatives, we've also postulated that this might be a separate structure that may have acted as a marker, a monument in itself, or even a barrier breaking the line of sight between the entranceway and the door of the roundhouse. In the northeast corner, there are some ephemeral post holes and finds that may suggest a smaller roundhouse, if not a working area. I've also highlighted in pale blue two pits to the north of the enclosure, up here and here, as these contained the highest by far concentrations of prehistoric pottery on the site and likely represent rubbish pits associated with this occupation. This pottery is a great indicator of rubbish deposition, as prehistoric bone survival in the damp and acidic soils was virtually non-existent. Before I delve further, just a quick video clip to provide a further ideal idea of scale for the enclosure. You can see here that we're excavating segments through the ditch before we remove the soil in between to sample 100%. You'll also see towards the end one of the four post structures in the foreground, just to give you an idea again of the size of those post holes. The misty cold weather you see here was also fairly typical throughout. The function of the central four post structure is thrown into greater question when we examine the placement of the four post structure immediately west of the ditch, both marked here as red squares, while the hoard appears as yellow. Using my fairly crude schematic, we have a clear alignment east northeast to west northwest that runs through the entrance of the enclosure, through both the four post structures, through the roundhouse and the location of the hoard. Intriguingly, the entrance to the enclosure is in the opposite side to the river and the marsh, potentially opening onto a route that would run along the edge of the marshland corridor, leading towards sites such as Mucking to the east. Given the location of the hoard, it is clearly being deposited with relation to the water, but deliberately not in it, suggesting this was not the kind of wet offering in which objects were deliberately disposed of. It also raises the possibility that many bronze items previously recovered from the Thames may not have been deposited in the river, but washed out of similar bankside or marshside locations. The component of this that intrigues me the most is not actually the physical hoard, blasphemy to many, but the odd full post structure outside the enclosure, which is so incongruous. The alignment of the enclosure and the structures means the sunrise will shine through the entrance, possibly given the slightly northeasterly tilt, most optimally around the summer solstice, and the sunset will cast light on the shielded area of the hoard. However, I can't help feel that the entire construction is as much aligned with respect of the river acting as a transitional space from the gravel terrace to an area of special or restricted activity. Did the Western four post structure act as a platform, as a marker or shrine, or most speculatively, did it support some kind of access between the roundhouse and marshland, potentially passing over the, passing over the hoard? On the right hand side, I put a very rudimentary model of four post supports, and you can only speculate at the myriad of things this might have supported extending out from those supports. 
That conspicuous deposition was focused on the western arm of the enclosure, may be supported by the seemingly more mundane distribution of pottery. As I've previously mentioned, the highest concentrations of late Bronze Age pottery are actually in pits just outside the enclosure. But if we look at the distribution of sherds in the enclosure ditch, there are significant biases. There are modest elevations of sherds around the terminus of the entranceway, and limited quantities in the north and south arms, which may have been recut and scoured in prehistory. Strikingly, in the northern half of the western arm, here, there is a significant concentration of sherds, but only on one side of the hoard and indeed of the roundhouse suggesting that this area was the focal point of domestic or more enigmatic consumption. I'm going to touch very briefly on the nature of the pottery, mainly because unlike the metalwork, it will not be fully recorded or analysed until further excavations have been concluded. We have the expected range of late Bronze Age post Deverell Rimbri vessels, which characterise the period, including coarse and fine calcined flint tempered fabrics, a range of bowls, jars and cups with fingernail decoration on the rim or shoulder, occasionally with applied thumb impressed strips on larger jars and often with flint gritted bases. Here we have the base of a particularly fine polished bowl with a distinctive omphalos base, that's the circular kick up, um, and incised grooves on the body. But what must be said is the quantity of pottery and vessels is commensurate with relatively low magnitude domestic activity. Presuming the site was in use for a modest duration, and I'll come to that, the assemblage was likely generated by a small domestic unit, paling into insignificance compared to the populations supported at Mucking and Chadwell St Mary. This begs the question, why such a small group associated with such an enigmatic site? Are we looking at voluntary guardians or stewardship of the site? Was the site and its contents, metal or people, deliberately kept off limits? Was there a societal acceptance that a small group separate itself from the larger settlements, but remain within easy logistical reach? Sticking with limited domestic activity at the moment, and as much to confirm parallels with other local sites, the enclosed area produced low quantities of perforated clay plates, whose distribution was mapped by Timothy Champion on the map of late Bronze Age sites along the Lower Thames earlier. If these on this site were associated with an oven or hearth, their low quantity suggests it was singular. Similarly, one of the pits in the same area produced a complete cylindrical loom weight, probably enough to weigh down a single warp beam, that is the taut vertical threads on a small loom. More importantly, the survival of these fired clay objects act as a control sample. Their preservation suggests no other fired clay, such as moulds for bronze objects or other evidence of metalworking, had become so friable and degraded that they did not survive. Therefore, they really are absent despite the large scale accumulation of bronze. One final enclosure thought before I focus on bronze objects. This is Broomfield, Chelmsford, with a very similar shape, dimensions and principal roundhouse. It has a similar pottery assemblage and clay plates, but no evidence of any bronze deposition. Also, like our enclosure, it is slightly removed from seemingly larger contemporary centres of settlement, namely the ringwork at Springfield Lions, which includes evidence for a bronze refractory even more substantive than that at Mucky. So might we be seeing a distinction of contained nodes within the landscape with a similar design, or is it merely coincidental that these are small domestic units effectively in orbit to larger centres? They seem a little conspicuously different to me. I spoke earlier about the change in methodology 
moving to excavate 100% of the enclosure, a rare opportunity in commercial archaeology. This was prompted when the first part of a hoard was narrowly missed by a segment through the enclosure ditch, but the neat vertical section crumbled away to reveal telltale green pieces of bronze. The segment, the original segment marked here in red line, was duly cut back. And here you can see where it was taken to to fully expose on that what that day was assumed to be all of a single hoard. As it was assumed to be a single entity, what would become known as Hoard 1 was carefully cleaned and excavated on site due to the typical time constraints of a Friday afternoon in the winter on a large site that could not be secured from the threat of illegal metal detecting. As layers of the hoard were cleaned and removed piece by piece, the scale of even this single deposit increased. You can see here a degree of arrangement in the sorting of objects as they emerge, with a layer of axes at the top of Hoard 1 providing a fantastic image of the hoard. This may evidence sorting as the hoards were accumulated or packed, or possibly just the natural movement of objects as they were carried, but I'll return to that later. I mentioned time constraints and the surprising number of objects that emerged just from the first group of bronze. As a winter's afternoon and evening closed in, the objects were meticulously recorded and lifted, with the team continuing to work by torchlight until after 9pm to make sure they had all of the material. It's a testament to all of their dedication and determination that this torchlight image has become something of a signature image for the project. Lo and behold, when returning the following Monday, the team began to excavate the ditch segments adjacent to the hoard, only to encounter a second, third, and then fourth group of bronze objects. Phone calls to report their status to the office came thick and fast that day. Because of the exponential increase in magnitude and the greater time now available through a new week, these three groups were excavated slightly differently. They were loosely cleaned around so that a board could be inserted underneath with bubble wrap, bandages and tape wrapped around them so they could be block lifted and loaded into a van. No mean feet, they were not light. From there, they could be delivered to a laboratory and the wonderful hands of Pieter Greaves here on the right, who could micro excavate them in controlled conditions to retrieve as much information as possible before conservation could begin. Here we can see the invisible hands of Pieta as she dissects Hoard 2. Um, what you can't see between frames is that she was labelling every item as it was lifted, so we can check back as to individual placement. At this point, we deviated slightly from normal progress, driven by the public engagement I touched upon at the start of the talk. Normally, we'd ask Pieta to clean and conserve all of the items, but the Museum of London had asked us to keep a large part close to the state in which it emerged from the ground for the purposes of exhibition and a sense of realism for the general public. So Pieta checked all the items to make sure they were stable and would not corrode, as well as x-raying everything. She conserved only a selection of items, so you will see bronze in varying conditions in the photos I come to, from shiny to dull. So what do the four groups of metal look like? once they've been taken apart. I'm indebted to Dr. Sophia Adams for these pictures and much that follows on the metalwork, as she was the specialist that received the bronze for the next stage of recording and specialist analysis. I'm going to summarize some of the salient points of the hoard. Otherwise, I'll be talking metalwork into the night, but any mistakes or omissions are entirely my own. Sophia's work has been incredibly detailed and will contribute a massive part to the forthcoming report. 
Hordes one, two and three are similarly sized, comprising between 122 and 155 items, weighing between 11.1 and 14.3 kilograms, with the weight difference primarily accounted for by the presence of large or smaller fragments of ingots. Horde four, in the bottom right, is noticeably smaller, with only 45 items, weighing 7.4 kilograms. It was also the uppermost in the ditch set deposits. It may be that this was the remainder of a single large group after three earlier package of metalwork had already been assembled. Or it may be part of it had been subsequently been re retrieved and removed after the initial deposition. It's also possible that each of the four groups are composite with layers that were themselves accumulated over time in the ditch or prior to burial, perhaps placed together in the roundhouse, but I will explore this more as we go. I'm zooming in on Horde 1 to illustrate the mixing composition, but I'm going to talk through items lifted from across the hordes. There is a degree of consistency in the specific types of item common across the hordes, with some rarer pieces unique to each group. These place each hoard within the Ewart Park phase of the Late Bronze Age, circa 900 to 800 BC. You would also notice that consistently almost all the items are represented by broken fragments. In fact, Hoard 1 has only 20 complete items out of 131, just 15%, while Hoards 2 to 4 have less than 10 each. And even these complete items are all broken and beyond practical and functional use. Furthermore, despite all attempts, there is not a single piece that refits to another in the entire assemblage. Each fragment is from a separate unique item, suggesting in prehistory a very deliberate process of selection, which I will return to in my conclusions. Each hoard is comprised of 30 to 40 percent axes or pieces thereof, 5 to 10 percent sword fragments, 2 to 8 percent spearheads, with the remainder uh, rarer implements and fittings or ingot fragments and casting waste. In totem, the Havering hoard compares well with the composition of other hoards from southeastern England, such as the Watford hoard in the Ashmolean Museum. However, the deposition of four hoards together remains exceptional, and some of the rarer items have distinctive continental affinities that lead us to look out of the mouth of the River Thames towards northern France. One final eco fact that must not be overlooked is what sat between the bronze items. As Pieter excavated the block lifted hoards, it became clear that a significant amount of packing material in the form of straw and grass possibly reeds, was preserved as mineralised material. Some of the mineralised material was adhering to the surfaces of objects, especially the flat edges of swords. But unfortunately, the mineralisation process was too far progressed to allow for C14 dating. The use of packing material raises some vexing questions. Firstly, if it is present, why is there no evidence, mineralised or other, of a container, be it basketry, animal hide, or even wood. Was the packing material introduced as the objects were buried, or earlier, potentially as the packages were assembled, on site in the roundhouse, or carried from an outside location? No container would have made, would have made transport difficult, nigh on impossible, unless the items were tipped out along with the packing material. But if this was the case, they are very neatly formed groups in the ground. The pits they were placed in must have been holes that almost matched the containers in volume and size. And that doesn't seem entirely plausible. Secondly, the packing material helps inform on the arrangement of items in each hoard, as there are clear intermediate layers of plant material, especially in hoards two and three, possibly a byproduct of pockets of anaerobic preservation or possibly human agency. With the pictures of Horde 1 earlier, we saw a clear layer of axes on top, with larger ingot fragments at the bottom and a more mixed group of spears, swords and other items in between. Hordes 2 and 3, 
perhaps give a slightly greater impression of disorder, but some arrangement is visible. Horse 2 appears to have axe fragments towards the top, with strap fittings, sword and spear fragments immediately below, before axes appear on one side, opposed to ingot fragments on the opposite side, with spear and bracelet fragments in between, and then more mixed objects below. The impression is not of a single homogeneous but mixed group, rather handfuls of different material assembled to form each bundle of bronze. Looking at object types within the hordes, axes dominate, primarily socketed types that are common in southeast England, some of which have wing, rib or facet decoration, demonstrated by the six examples on the left hand side of this slide. In fact, this variation is so great that no two axes appear to have been produced by the same mould, suggesting they were accrued from a wide variety of metal workers in the region. Moulds for this type of axe would have been quicker and simpler to produce than far more complex or decorative types, emphasising that most people probably possessed at least one as a tool. But there is a subtlety to their design, and they would have had a different feel depending on their type. Different examples might have been for different types of woodworking or for different scales of chopping, for example. Sparse other axe types were also present, such as the end winged axe illustrated here on the right, but they do not contradict the dating of the hordes. All of our axes are broken in some way, and despite some casting seams remaining present, none are new or freshly cast. It's just that there wasn't a focus on aesthetic finishing as there might be for modern objects. In fact, many of the axe blades have been heavily chipped by impact and extensively resharpened, and the splits in most of the sockets may have resulted from force pushed through the axe head during use. But a lot of damage appears to have happened after use, and be re possibly related to the fragmentation of objects through hammering, battering, crushing and splitting. Experiments by Matt Knight have shown that heating objects can assist the shattering of them into similar fragments to those in the hordes, which feeds our thoughts on the deliberate decommissioning of items and the selection of fragments from respective objects to be removed from circulation, and possibly removed from the recasting process or set aside for it. Like the swords, the spearheads are all Ewart Park types primarily flame-shaped socketed types, as the left and centre examples depict. Other types include a hollow bladed tip with small barbs on the right, seems altogether more vicious. Um, many of these also appear deliberately broken, with sockets squashed and hammered, or tips snapped across the blade. One spearhead, one of the limited items fully cleaned in conservation, revealed how finely crafted these items could be, quite beyond their primary function. Around the socket was decorated with incised bands, V-shapes and dots, that really only would have been visible to the bearer or from very close quarters. This also tells us that the spear was re-hafted, as the vacant and presumably unemployed peg hole is decorated with punched holes around it. Whereas, the peg hole that's filled with a rivet or pin is not decorated, suggesting that at a later date, it was perforated through the lower part of the socket as a new handle was inserted. The majority of the sword fragments belong to classic Ewart Park variants and have been fairly meticulously broken into small lengths. And I can't help think some almost appear to represent multiples of one, two or three units of unidentified weight or measurement. The fracture line on many of these fragments is also often bent and rarely twisted where pressure has been applied to snap them. We only have two tip fragments present and these are both also bent, while the hilt and handle fragments are slightly larger, presumably because they were harder to break. The central fragment is a particularly nice example, preserving the rivet holes um, on the handle 
and the ricasso or unsharpened recessed section that sits between the handle and the ribbed blade, which is just here. It's quite irresistible to try and lay these fragments out to envisage a full sword, though on our attempt at the right here I can see that the handle actually belongs to a dagger or a knife rather than a sword. In addition to the Ewart Park types, there are also a few fragments of Carp's Tongue Swords, originally named because it's what they were supposed to look like. They included more elaborate variants, such as this blade with grooved decoration of Veynat type, paralleled in a hoard at Charente in Western France. You can see where the fracture of this fragment is also bent from where it was snapped. Um, and similar sword fragments were present in the Borstal Hoard in Kent, as well as many others in northern France. Related to the swords in manufacture, Hoard 3 was notable for containing both tanged knives on the left here um, and hogsback knives on the right. You can see the differences in the blade must have been related to very, very different functions. Before I leave weapons, or at least aggressive tools behind, I have to talk about this bag-shaped shape, which would have sealed the end of a scabbard to a sword or knife. It's an exquisite little item that preserves another testament to the fine manufacture of composite weapons and fittings. The small perforation here preserved a very tiny wooden dowel that would have fastened it to leather or cloth. You can see stretched across here the wood with ever such slight splits coming through it, which may in part have been created by the fact that it was sealed in place by a tiny copper pin that was hammered into the wooden dowel to expand it to fit the socket. The copper pin is less than two millimetres wide. It's an exquisite little piece of craftsmanship. Aside from weapons, the hoard included many other bladed implements, both for craft and possibly personal use. This is the only example of a symmetrical double-sided razor in our hoard, alongside a reference example with a V-shaped notch and a central perforation between blades. A fragment of a similar razor was recorded in the Watford hoard, associated with a type of looped back disc also in this hoard that I will come to. Equally sharp, and possibly my favourite implement in this assemblage, are fragments of scythe in hordes two and three. These have a very flat, shallow blade and are typically known as Minis Bay types after hordes where they were previously been recorded in Kent. The edges are notched and worn and one has to wonder if they were used for cereals, straw and grasses, or possibly even the marshland reeds that would have abutted our site and served a variety of domestic functions. Also, these have been fractured by bending in exactly the same way as the swords. This incredibly preserved awl is another tool represented by just one example, this time in Hoard 2. It has a very carefully crafted lozenge-like end and may originally have been double-ended, perhaps with a finer point or chisel end at the opposite terminus. It has a square projection from the mid body, which is not associated with casting, and this might have allowed a handle or similar projection to be affixed to aid in the moving and angling of the awl as you worked. This would have allowed really very fine woodworking. Um, comparable examples are very rare, but are present in the Isle of Harty Hoard in Kent. Lingering on woodworking, Hordes 1, 2 and 4 contained gouges that attest to very skilled craftsmanship, be it creating joints, sockets, um, carving or hollowing out wood. Um, these have a robust collar to strengthen the round socket and a very sharp, narrow, concave blade that is always slightly notched or worn on the examples that we have. Thinking of what was being crafted in wood, it probably wasn't just structures but potentially boats and horse-drawn carts, um, wagons and such like. The latter would also have required harnesses um, of rope and leather, while leather would also be used for belts, straps and bags for general occupants. 
Rare fittings that attest to such harnessing include this loop back disc. Two small loops on the reverse would allow it to be fastened to leather or textile, but it's the bulbous rings on the front that catch the eye. When these were polished, these would really have reflected the light. They would have acted very much like much later medieval and post-medieval horse brasses, visually quite stunning. One of the highlights of the bronze items speaks further of horses, and it is a pair of rain rings, known as terret rings, with one complete example in Horde 3 and another fragmented in Horde 2. These were designed to prevent the reins tangling on a cart or even a chariot-like vehicle. Currently, no other examples are known in late Bronze Age hordes in Britain, although similar terret rings are present in hordes from La Chapelle in Normandy and Charente in Western France, highlighting continental connections, trade and possibly even craftsmen moving over the North Sea. Such unusual items would have been deemed precious to remove from circulation, especially as they appear to have been a complete pair, possibly deliberately broken or decommissioned, smashed before deposition. One must speculate if they were voluntary give, voluntarily given exacted or taken? Was the associated vehicle processional or even connected to the movement of goods, people or vessels from the highway along the marshes, from the highway of the river, through the marsh to specific landing sites? Aside from people and power and craft, what might have been landed with such merit? The hordes contain significant quantities of bun-shaped ingots, all deliberately broken up, with the largest weighing 1.9 kilograms. These are formed of copper cake from the base of a furnace, and there's certainly no smelting on our site. They may have been imported from Wales, Cheshire, the southwest of Britain, even continental sources such as Spain or the Alpine region of Central Europe. Future scientific analysis may determine sources, but it seems certain that not all of our ingot fragments came from a single source. Bronze Age specialists continue to debate the trade and supply of raw materials and their social context. But here we have a substantive presence of ingots on a site at least superficially disassociated with the smelting or casting of bronze. The apparent absence of evidence for at least the casting of bronze within our enclosure is at odds with the presence of casting waste that has been accumulated and deposited within all of the hordes. They include jets, sprues and runs that have occurred as molten bronze was poured into a mould and rose up, spilling out of the casting gate. So we must question, where did it come from and why? Clearly it still had material value and could be recast. To somebody it had enough value to be taken temporarily or permanently out of circulation and retained in our hordes alongside partial fragments of so many other implements. Before I try and bring together the site and hoard, one final bronze item. This wide bracelet was present in Horde 3, probably formed from sheep bronze or a very hollow mould. It would have been highly reflective when smooth and polished. Like our terret rings, this is not a typically British item and is paralleled in a hoard in Cher in the Loire region of central France. Therefore, our continental connections through the River Thames seem even closer. It is exceptional in Britain to have four hoard groups deposited together, not simply in close proximity, but as a homogenous group though that need not reflect a single event. We've looked at the nature of individual objects, but in typology we can lose sight of wider human behaviour. To our occupants, an axe was likely new, sharp, effective, blunt, resharpened or broken. But at either end of its narrative life, the birth and death if you like, many have speculated on a spirituality perceived in the skill of manipulating metal. Or are we looking at a deeper economy, complexity in the accumulation and control of metal, possibly connected to socio-political structures? Firstly, the simple behaviours that are evident. The hoard was placed in four parts, seemingly in a single pit or depression within a partially silted up enclosure ditch. 
The relative consistency of each part indicates they were broadly contemporary, but we can't be sure if they were deposited on the same day, week or season, especially as for certain or conclusively, no two fragments join with one another. However, the way the four parts are spaced out about a metre between them is enough for a single person to stand on a known spot and have the hordes passed down to them. Even more conceivable if the location was marked or accessed by a platform or structure. And here, once again, I think of our mysterious four post structures. Each horde could be lifted and carried by a single person, but you wouldn't want to carry them far. I'm also still nagged about the presence of mineralized packing material, but no evidence of any form of organic container. And does the possible degree of sorting within the hordes indicate each part was not deposited as one, but was built up over a period? Packing could be added as they went, no matter whether the hoard was actually assembled within the ditch or within the roundhouse or further afield. This brings me to possibly the one question that challenges the way we might perceive the enclosure and the placement of hordes within its own narrative. It's clear that the hordes were placed when the ditch was considerably silted up, possibly largely by material washed off the bank that overlooked it from the interior. Thus, the hordes were only placed about halfway up the depth of the ditch, if we assume where ground level was, with one even slightly cut into the bank. The immediate conclusion drawn from this, and one fitting some schools of thought on hoard deposition, is that this was a closure deposit, the ritualistic disposal of a conspicuous quantity of material as an offering, or to deliberately remove it permanently from circulation. I was never entirely happy with this, partly because given the location, if you want to achieve a dramatic episode of disposal, why not use the river or marsh? But perhaps it related to the enclosure as a specific space. So I'll give it a chance. It continued to nag me how I might postulate a reframing of this. One comment by a member of the excavation team, Anna Zupancic, prompted me to formulate an alternative theory rather than regurgitating varying theories on hoard deposition well established by my peers and betters who study the Bronze Age and metalwork. Anna was looking at the graphics for the Museum of London exhibition um, and some of the artistic work, which is great work. And she said, I'm so glad they included hedges. I always envisaged it having hedges. And she's right. The wind can be so cold off the river and we have so many hedged boundaries across southeastern England, but these leave little trace in the archaeological record, especially if they were on banks. So as well as considering the narrative of the life of bronze items, I thought similarly about the evolution of the enclosure, which brings me to this. The ditch of the enclosure need not be constant, not only in its formation and erosion processes, but also in its function as its context within a human landscape changes. The enclosure originally appears to have been cut with a deep V-shaped profile and presumably a corresponding steep internal bank to act as a barrier, specifically a barrier. The site is in a wet environment and the ditch would have naturally silted up, aided by the weathering of the bank. Nonetheless, it would have remained functional as a drainage channel. And although sections of it may have been recut, it was certainly not extensively maintained as a deep defensive feature. So did it become and remain a border, not required as a barrier, but potentially with a hedge or similar vegetation, continuing to softly define that same space in the landscape? Most pertinently, why might this transition have occurred and what does it imply for our hordes? If we accept either our hordes were accumulated off site and brought to the enclosure, or that individual items or small groups were brought to our roundhouse with fragments selected and collated into the hordes, we must accept the value, valuable commodities, quantities of metal were moving through our landscape zone on the gravel terraces. The limited scale of artefactual deposition across our site suggests it was not occupied by a large group, 
be they associated with a wider community or not. So when this enclosure was established, were they not initially secure in their location, hence a very defensive barrier? And if defensive, did the earliest activity on the site still depend on the accumulation and sorting of bronze, either as fragments, ingots or broken items? At this point, did insecurity dictate that the bronze remained a mobile, above-ground commodity that they could evacuate with and transport if necessary? Over time, perhaps relationships within our Bronze Age landscape changed. Perhaps the occupants of our site and their activities no longer felt threatened. They no longer felt the need for a defensive barrier, but the enclosure remained defined. Perhaps the points of authority had established their role in the accumulation and movement of bronze. As such, access to the site was by consent and respect, fixed by societal and economic norms. Therefore, there was no consideration of flight with the heavy resource of bronze, and a cache of material as a temporary or permanent deposit could be maintained on the site in the form of our grouped hordes. This may chime with the location of the hordes in the seemingly most restricted area of the site, physically and visually blocked from the entrance and seemingly enclosed on three sides by natural areas of wetness. To conclude, perhaps we can speculate on models of activity that flowed through our enclosure and created a transition or output that was our horde deposition. These are purely speculative, and of two models, parts of both may be true. But it is these that I believe reframe how we consider late Bronze Age Hall deposition, at least on this site. My first model works on the basis that only the final stages of accumulation and hall deposition occurred within our enclosure. The left hand column is simply the accepted first creation and lifespan of a bronze implement. We can postulate that our occupants acted as mobile carriers of bronze in a given territory, travelling between population centres and settlements, perhaps periodically or on constant rotation. Obviously, anyone could own a bronze tool, but was the supply and surplus of raw and finished materials controlled? Was this by restriction of knowledge where only a select few could cast and recast bronze? with moulds made and deposited on sites separate from where the raw material was stored. Perhaps once an item was broken or there was surplus material from casting them, the material was returned to a specific individual or group, which need not be those that actually cast the bronze. And who may equally have been under control? If so, was the trade, casting and effectively banking of bronze also carefully controlled that these processes were kept separate, cordoned off from settlements by those in authority. An extension of this is that access to the enclosure was restricted by behaviour or belief, and that in collecting material has either been systematically or functionally broken or was surplus, they were returning the bronze to a sacred space. The enclosure may have been viewed as both a shrine and reserve of material that was overseen by the occupants, though on whose behalf, if not their own, is open to conjecture. If we accept social political power had a role in the control of bronze, and it seems unavoidable without being too capitalistic, was the collection of material effectively a tax, and were our occupants motivated or mobilised to travel around settlements with the collection of fragments taken from items as a tribute or payment. This may have contributed to the wealth of a ruling group or on a more spiritual level as an offering to those representing a belief system, a valuable commodity in either sphere. Did the officious or ceremonial roles of our occupants involve travelling out to oversee the breaking of objects and equally dedicating themselves to the rights of depositing material or hoards, or even praying to that material. My second proposition is a shift in location, but not the activities and roles I have just speculated upon. 
Rather than having the enclosure as a restricted space, perhaps it was a central node in a network of settlements and routeways that punctuated the landscape of the Lower Thames. All of the potential officious or sacred tasks may remain valid, but did individuals or groups from the various larger settlements and farmsteads seek out and travel to our enclosure? Did they bring bronze items to be broken or fragments to contribute to offerings or reserves that were communal or claimed by authority? Perhaps they brought items to the site which were broken so a piece could be retained and the remainder was blessed or permitted to be recast. It seems quite feasible that our roundhouse could have acted as a sorting centre in which material was quantified or inspected, much like my desk when people bring me archaeological artefacts. Given the alignment and arrangement of the site and hoard, I would speculate the hoard groups resided in a restricted space. Perhaps when the business of fragment selection had been completed and the supplicants departed, there was a process or ritual of deposition maybe at sunset. I can also envisage the horde groups acting as a cache of material, in a sense returning to the idea of a founder's horde. Perhaps bronze was redistributed from our roundhouse, with an offering removed for the horde, or perhaps the hordes were not intended as a permanent deposit, but are the resource from which raw material could be bartered or requested, to be taken forth to a settlement where an artisan could recast it. I can't offer a definitive role for the striking collection of four hordes, the Havering Horde, but I hope these results allow us to reframe how many seemingly isolated hordes might be reconsidered in a narrative. As a parting note, um, I really do have to make just a quick few thank yous to and acknowledgements to those that have made this project happen. Um, to Andy Clark and Ingraborn Valley for funding the excavation, to Claire Halpin and Archaeological Solutions for undertaking the excavation, in particular Joe Locke and all of the excavation team for all their very hard work on site. Um, special thanks are due to Pieter Greaves and Sophia Adams for their work on conservation and metalwork analysis respectively. It would also be remiss not to say it's been absolutely inspirational to collaborate with Kate Sumnall and all of her colleagues at the Museum of London in the development of the exhibition on the Havering Horde. Please go and visit if you can. Um, they have created a wonderful vision of late Bronze Age society um, to engage with the public and bring this to a whole different life. Um, yeah, please go to Docklands and visit. Lastly, um, thank you all for listening and especially to the Committee of LAMAS for organising tonight. It's been a pleasure.